I'm Diane Blazik. I'm the Executive Director for National Garden Bureau, who is sponsoring these webinars. I also run All America Selections. And so if you hear me talk about some AAS winners, that's why I'm throwing those in. I also have Gail Pabst on here. She's gonna help me manage the chat and the waiting room as more people come in. And right now we have one of our two panelists. We'll see if we can get the other one on. So we have Dick Zondag from Jung Seeds. Welcome, Dick. Thank you, Diane. Yes. And nice with you. Well, thank you so much for making it. Um, if she is able to get an internet or phone connection, we will also have Patty Buskirk from Seeds by Design. But Dick has assured us that he can do this. He's, he's got the knowledge. He can answer our questions. So um, before we get to my questions, Dick, do you want to introduce yourself formally and tell a little bit about your company? Sure. Or companies, I should say. Yeah. Um... I'm the president of J.W. Jung Seed Company in Randolph, Wisconsin, and we're a multi-channel uh, marketer. We have five garden centers in the, in the uh, Wisconsin area, three of them in the Madison area, one in Stevens Point, and one in Randolph. Um, we also have eight different catalog titles. Uh, I think uh, if you get one of them, you probably get most of them. Uh, we have seeds in five of them. That would be Totally Tomatoes, Vermont Bean, Jung Seed, of course, uh, R.H. Shumway, and Horticultural Products and Services. And then on top of that, we have a perennial catalog called Roots and Rhizomes, a rose catalog called Edson, Edmonds Roses, Quarry Farm Gourds, and I think that's it. So. Um, yeah, we, we print a lot of catalogs and we have a lot of great customers out there and uh, I'm very uh, happy to, uh, to uh, um, participate in this webinar. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, with, with all those different catalogs, you must, I can't even imagine the SKUs you have. So um, that's, that's why you and your staff are very much experts on a lot of different categories. So. Right. Today it's going to be melons, and I think a lot of people's questions will probably focus on watermelons, but we'll we'll see as we go through. And so maybe you can just talk about. Uh, let's start with the different types of melons that people might grow in their home garden, and and maybe you know a couple signature characteristics of each one, or what makes them easy or hard to grow. Right. Well, with watermelons, the main uh, type of watermelon that people grow are the are the uh, picnic, what are called picnic watermelons. And you can get those either in a hybrid or in an open pollinated. We'll talk about the hybrid first. Um, hybrid uh, watermelons tend to uh, be uh, larger, sweeter, and they are more uniform because the genetics of the, of the uh, uh, watermelon are very closely related. And so they, um, they do very well uh, um, in uh, most gardens. Uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, varieties would be uh, Crimson Sweet, Sweet Beauty, um, Summer Moon, um, and then the open pollinated varieties are the ones that you'd find in a, in a, a, a catalog. And the difference between an open pollinated and a, and a hybrid is the hybrid is very closely genetic. Uh, genetically, the, the parents are controlled very closely and with an open pollinated, you plant out a seedling population and then you go through and pick out the variety, uh, the, the melons that uh, most are exemplary of the variety that you're selling. So, uh, and then that melon is used for the, for the uh, stock uh, seed for the next crop. And so uh, every time you plant it, it should get closer to what uh, you advertise that at. And some of the, uh, the ones that uh, are in that, category would be like Black Diamond, um, uh, Sun and Moon. Um, there are just a whole bunch of them. And uh, those would be like in our Shumway catalog, where a lot of the Shumway things are very uh, op open pollinated. Then you have your icebox watermelons, which are smaller and are more suited for um, growing on a, a fence or on a small, uh, in a small area because they're smaller melons and they're not so large that you have to eat them all at one time. So uh, some of the varieties in that would be uh, 
mini love and sugar baby and then another icebox one which is not red but yellow which is very very sweet of the yellow doll so those are all varieties in the in the uh, um, icebox uh, uh, category seedless um, and i know there'll be a question on how we do seedless but the seedless watermelons um, are varieties that uh, are triploids and you have to put a seeded variety in with them so they have cross pollination and form the fruit but the fruit that comes from the uh, from the seed that are that are grown as seedless would have the very small seeds or no seeds at all and varieties like that would be solitaire summer sweet and there's a yellow one called yellow buttercup um, and uh, and then you have the yellow fleshed and the orange fleshed which are also very sweet, but uh, most people like the, the red watermelons. Um, with watermelons uh, in, in Randolph here in Randolph, Wisconsin, we have a very short growing season. So with most watermelons, if you're gonna grow them, you almost have to start them indoors around the 1st of May in peat pots. Uh, vine crops do not like to be transplanted. Uh, so you can't just grow them in a in a, uh, a flat and then take them out of the flat and put them in the garden because that'll stunt them. Most of the time, if you plant seeds, they'll be come into fruit as, as fast as the ones that you plant from a flat. But uh, if you put them in jiffy pots or peat pots where you can plant them uh, right in the garden, they tend to take off right away. And you want to start the seeds about a month before the soil is, is uh, ready to go. So in our area, May 1 is a good time for that. Um, let's see what else. Some of the problems that you have with watermelons are the vine borer and the vine borer, uh, uh, there are pesticides that you can use for it. But what I recommend people do is, you know, as the vine is growing, uh, wherever a leaf comes out, you'll have a tendril and that tendril uh, will differentiate into another root system if you put soil over the root. So, you put soil like, uh, probably three feet away from the where the plant is coming out of the ground. You put a shovel full of soil over that uh, vine as that uh, plant is growing. It'll grow another root system. So if you get a vine bore between there and the, and the uh, uh, outside of the plant, it's not going to kill the whole plant. Um, other than that, uh, with watermelons, there is a, uh, a disease called Phytophthora which is a very devastating disease for uh, watermelons. It can rot the watermelon, but it only is prevalent when, um, when you have a very wet growing season and you have a very moist environment. Most of the time that particular uh, uh, fungus does not grow. Um, this year we've had a very dry summer in Wisconsin and there probably nobody that has any trouble with that, but it's a, it's a soil borne disease. Uh, um, it can go on the seed coat. We try to ensure that uh, the seed is, is um, free of the, that particular disease. Um, and uh, we do our best to, to control that. Um, Okay, so um, on the watermelons, I'm just gonna summarize uh, the three types. I think these are the three types. I was gonna ask you about one other. Um, so a picnic watermelon, which would be the larger size, the ice box that is smaller, and then the seedless. Yep. Um, what about bush type watermelons? Is that just, okay, so some are bush type and some have long vines and they're still within those three categories? Yeah, uh, the bush type, uh, all of the bush type vine crops have a very determined size of, of the vine. And so um, if you're growing it in a container or something like that, you'll want to use the bush type uh, um, watermelons and it'll get about a three foot vine and then it'll stop and you maybe get three, uh, two to three nice watermelons per vine. And so, yeah, the bush can be another um, another uh, type of uh, watermelon and muskmelon also. Like there are some muskmelons that have a shor shorter uh, um, uh, vine. The mini, uh, the mini love, uh, one of the newer varieties is a, is a good example of the, uh, the bush type uh, vine. You get maybe two or three really nice, uh, um, two or three really nice uh, fruit per, per vine. 
So you mentioned many loves. So I have to tell my, my funny story now. Um, so I'm growing mine in a container and because I knew that mini love would be a good one for that. And so I planted them and they had exactly that, like three to four foot vines and tons of blooms. I had one probably, you know, maybe a softball baseball size one on it. Some storms came through and kind of twisted the vines and broke off one of my fruits. And I was so devastated, you know, it's like, oh, my watermelon and it, and it broke it off. Then I went out by a week later. Um, I hadn't been outdoors for quite a while. I think that's when I was traveling. And I have these metal wrought iron chairs that have kind of a flat leg about one inch wide. One of those blooms had started a watermelon and it was under that leg. It was flat as a pancake. And again, probably four or five inches around. I'm like, oh my gosh. So I took the chair off. It is now about six inches around. And that was maybe a week ago. So it was just, it was waiting to grow. So I can't wait for waiting this to melon. Be yeah, you're going to have a pancake uh, watermelon. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. Um, what about other melons? So let's hear, um, somebody had asked the question, what's the difference between cantaloupe and musk melon? So that's two additional types of melons is musk right. melon and cantaloupe. Um, there's very little difference between musk melon and cantaloupe. They're, they're basically the same. Um, uh, some people, uh, uh, think of the open pollinated varieties as cantaloupe, uh, but, uh, and uh, other people think the more netting they have, the, the, the cantaloupes are less netted than the musk melons, but they're basically the same thing. And there again, in the, in the cantaloupe family, you have um, open pollinated and hybrids. The hybrids tend to be sweeter, have a, a thicker uh, meat to them. Um, the, the seed cavity tends to be smaller. Um, they tend to ripen a, a lot more uniformly. Um, some good examples of the uh, cantaloupe uh, would be Ambrosia, which is one of our best sellers. Athena, uh, Aphrodite, they're hybrids. Open pollinators, again, are the ones that you plant the seed out and you can save seeds of those because they, uh, they tend to come back. Uh, Probably my favorite would be Delicious 51. That's been around forever. Um, there's also Amish and uh, Jenny Lind are two varieties that are quite popular in the open pollinated varieties. Um, other uh, types of cantaloupe type uh, fruits would be the honeydews. And the honeydews have green flesh and they're very sweet and they store quite well. Um, winter melons, uh, the crunch, uh, the cr the Creshaw mussins are, uh, are, are uh, water, uh, the winter melons uh, and Santa Claus is another variety. And then the last one I have is the Charon Taste, which is a French melon. It has very light um, musk melon color to very uh, sometimes pink, a pink hue. And they tend to be a little smaller also, but they're very sweet also. So there are several different kinds of uh, cantaloupes or musk melons, uh, uh, but all of them have a very sweet flesh. And uh, there again, in our area, we almost have to start them indoors a month before uh, before the soil is warm. And then you plant them out and they're, they have a vine of maybe six inches long and they take right off from there. And I always, in my own garden, uh, if I'm planting uh, melons, I always plant a few from uh, with peat pots and I plant a few with uh, seeds, uh, three or four seeds in a hill, because sometimes if you injure that root system when you're transplanting it, the seedlings will come just as fast, if not faster than the ones you have in peat pots. Okay, great. And it looks like we have Patty Buskirk on the line, so we can't see her, but we'll be able to hear her. So welcome, Patty. Do you want to give a quick introduction of yourself? So yeah, thanks guys. I'm having technical difficulty. They decided to, you know, service our internet at my house here in New Mexico uh, today at 10 o'clock, which, which was perfect timing, don't you know? So yes, I'm uh, one of the principal owners of Seeds by Design and um, I breed cantaloupes and watermelons and I'm happy to be here and answer any of your questions. Great. Good timing because somebody just asked a question, which was next on my list. Um, I always like for 
whoops, for the breeding companies to tell us what they're working on. Um, you know, are they making a more disease resistant, larger, smaller? And somebody said, is there any breeding work going on to make it a little bit more cold hardy? So Patty, I think you can answer that one. Sure. Um, but as you know, most cantaloupes and watermelons, you know, I wouldn't re even refer to them as, you know, even cold hardy type, fruit, you know, plants because, you know, they're desert originally, you know, desert dwelling, warm, warm, warm season um, species. So um, I, I would, I don't know if there, you know, would say that there's any real breeding going on for cold hardiness, but, and it, it, it is been discussed. And I know that people are selecting for, um, both cantaloupes and watermelons that set in cooler climates. So and it, that's why I mean I don't like the term cold hardy because that makes it sound like it's almost frost resistant. But um, watermelons, they in triploid production, for instance, they don't even set seed under like 52 degrees. You'll get a watermelon that'll be set, but they, they, there will be no viable seed. Does that make like make sense to anybody? And it tends to be that way. In cooler cooler night situations, cantaloupes and watermelons they'll set. They won't set as well as it's warm, but they will set when it's um, they they set less when it's less than fifty two degree nights. So, so basically, yes, they are, but they're they're basically doing it to increase seed production. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. And what I was going to say is they're <laughs> kind of the opposite of tomatoes. You know, tomatoes when it gets too too hot, they they the blooming really slows down. Whereas here it's when it gets too cool, the blooming slows down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Great. Great. Um, somebody asked what about the breeding work on winter storage melons? Okay. Sherry, I got to make sure I'm answer asking this question correctly. What about breeding on winter storage melons other than the one heirloom watermelon? Um, so like winter storage watermelons? or winter storage cantaloupes, you know, cantaloupe or melon type. Um, she's asking there, specifically on watermelon. I guess, is there in any breeding going on so that you can store watermelons longer? Um, not truly that I know of outside of a couple of, for, for instance, typically dark rind and there's a, a resurgence. I've had lots of requests for like dark rind watermelons and they tend to have a sturdier exterior or a sturdier rind thicker rind and they store better so I've had a lot of people ask for you know like you know you talked about picnic types being large types there are a type of watermelon called picnic which is a dark along you know all 100% green dark green elongated melon so I've had a lot more requests in the last couple of years for those and by, you know, and those actually do store a little longer than some of the striped ones that have thinner rinds. Okay. So I guess, yes, but it's kind of a roundabout way because it's a, and then as far as winter melons, there are people who are breeding um, hybrid Santa Claus types, Crenshaw's, cassavas. It's a super duper small market, very, very niche market, but there are people who are selecting and breeding F1s in those type of cantaloupe, of, of melons. Okay. Um, and one of the things then that I wanted to ask both of you, Patty, from a breeder standpoint and Dick from a retail standpoint, what kind of trends are you seeing? Like what types of melons have surged in demand? I know the past year is kind of difficult because everything has surged in demand. Um, but is it gravitating toward the smaller melon size, the smaller vine size? Is it the unique melons? Like, okay, I'll just go buy my watermelon at the store, but I want to buy something on the unique side. What, what do you guys each see for uh, what the demand and trends are? Go ahead, Patty. The, the two, yeah, the, the, um, definitely the shorter vines because of the increase of urban gardeners wanting to be able to grow other species outside of what currently is available. So, um, you know, bush, bush, definitely bush watermelons, definitely, you know, more, you know, restricted vine cantaloupes, smaller ones that are easier to grow. It's easier to grow um, smaller cantaloupes because like, like you, the experience you had, Diane, you know, the wind comes up and your fruit, other, otherwise, you got to put them in hammocks. I recommend people to, you know, tie them, put, put them on a fence or some kind of support, and then, you know, like a banana hammock, give them a give them a melon hammock, 
so they can continue to grow on your patio or on your garden, you know, in your garden space. Those, I, I think the biggest trend is people want to know more about how to grow watermelons and cantaloupes. That's, that's perfect. So, and we'll get into that uh, soon. So Dick, do you want to say anything about what you've uh, seen as far as your customer's interest? I think it's about the same because uh, uh, we're getting a lot of people growing uh, um, on patios or on balconies in apartment buildings. And you have to have something that's smaller because, uh, you know, in that situation, if you had a vine, you'd be growing vines down into your neighbor's uh, uh, view too. So the the smaller vines and the other thing too is that uh, housing lots are getting smaller and smaller and so if you want a garden you've got to have vegetables that don't just take over the, the backyard. Uh, so I uh, had a customer or someone that told me that they uh, um, got some soil in and it happened to have a, happened to have a uh, watermelon vine and it kind of took over the backyard and they didn't want to take it out, but uh, they're going to have uh, watermelon, but nothing else. So yeah, the small vines, the ones that can be trained on a fence, we're getting a lot of interest in strawberry gardening, uh, where people mm. grow uh, uh, vegetables and things on a, on a straw bale because they don't have a soil situation. And, and then they uh, and, uh, train the melons up on a, on a chain link fence. And like Patty said, they can uh, tie them up so that the weight I mean, if you're growing a, a small, even a small melon on a chain link fence, you've got to tie it up or it will break the vine once it gets to be a certain size. So um, the smaller melons, the, the shorter vines are definitely coming in, uh, although there are a lot of people in our area that have the room to grow the, 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 the long vines and they just love uh, the strawberry or the, uh, the watermelons and the muskmelons. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Dick, you had started to talk about growing. You said um, if you're in the northern climates, um, you want to start them indoor in peat pots. Can you give a general guideline like by last frost date? Like if your last frost date is mid-May, then yes, you should probably start them indoors. What What do you think is that cutoff point? Yeah, I, I would say even if the last frost date is the end of May, um, we always tell people to kind of note when their last frost date is. And, you know, if you're having a colder uh, spring, you've got to wait a little bit longer, but uh, four weeks before you want to plant them out is about the amount of time that you want to have, because you don't want to have a vine that's too long and the, the uh, roots coming too aggressively out of that peat pot when you plant it. So, uh, you know, uh, peat pots or peat pellets are, excellent ways to be able to plant uh, vine crops without damaging that root system. Okay, uh, Patty, is there anything you want to add on that part? Um, no, that was, you know, pretty, you know, pretty, that, that, that was a great, that was a, that was a great ex explanation. <laughs> and um, like, because he, he's exactly right. You know, the biggest problem that people have with, with watermelons and cantaloupes is the ground temperature, the soil temperature is not warm enough to seed. So the, I always recommend that you get a soil thermometer and if you don't start them inside and don't transplant or seed until the soil temperature is above 65 degrees. I even tell that to my seed production growers to have okay. the best success. Okay, yeah. 65 degrees then. Um, and that was one of my uh, questions about soil temperature. So making sure that your soil warms up in the spring, summer, yep. um, before you plant them, that's good. Um, what about how far apart to plant? I mean, you know, if you've got a vine, a 10 foot vine, do you need to plant them 10 feet apart or can you plant them closer? We always mm. help people put their, uh, you know, if they're using a, a normal, um, variety that has long vines uh, five feet apart and the rows maybe three to four feet apart. And with that soil temperature thing too, we also tell people that if they want to get started a little early, if they use black plastic, that they put down black plastic on the soil earlier, like in mid-April or the first part of May, uh, the black tends to uh, absorb the heat from the sun and will heat that soil up. And then like Patty said, if you've got a soil probe, uh, 
uh, thermometer, you, when you get 60 to 65 degrees, you can plant seeds or you can plant uh, peat pots out. And if, you, if you're using black plastic, uh, you just cut an X in the plastic, plant the plant and then pull the plastic back around the plant. And that way uh, you've got this, the, the heat of the sun warming that soil and, and the black plastic also keeps the weeds from growing, which is one thing I really love because I hate weeding. Yeah, and we do my I, I recommend a five foot row spacing and two two feet down the row, two feet to plant spacing. So just a lot of mix and mingle, in, in my, other words. Yeah. Yeah, it's whatever works for you. Yeah. And yeah. you know, a lot of and, and if you're going to, you know, trellis them, you know, or put them on a tomato tomato cage or something like that, you you know, that that's what we do. We we usually tie them up or vine train them. So that's why we put them at a two foot spacing. Gotcha. Okay. So then what about, um, cross pollination? So what if you're trying to grow a seedless and a seeded watermelon in your backyard, anything you should know? We put say that again, Diane. Oh, sorry. What about if you want to grow both a seeded and a seedless watermelon in your backyard? So let's say I'm only growing two varieties and I want a seeded one and a seedless. Is there anything I should be doing? There's no problem with that because the seedless watermelons will not produce seed no matter what you do to them. But you do have to have a seeded variety to cross pollinate so that that fruit sets. Um, when we when we package uh our seeds up. We put 10 seedless ones in the packet and one seeded one. So they're going to get one seeded one no matter what, but that's the one that they need to for the cross pollination. So the bees have some live pollen because seedless watermelons are triploids. They you cross a diploid with a tetraploid. That's four sets of genes and two sets of genes, and you get a triploid. And that's the way you make a seedless watermelon. The seed that comes from that cross is a, will be a, a, a triploid, and the triploid will not be seeded. So uh, you have to have uh, a seeded, uh, uh, you know, a regular diploid uh, plant in amongst them to get the seeds to set the fruit, but uh, the fruit will not, um, you know, will not be seeded because it's next to a seeded variety. Excellent. Exactly. Yeah. So... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Triploids are a hundred percent sterile. I always tell people that it's like crossing a donkey and a horse, and you end up with a mule, and the mule is completely sterile and can't reproduce. So if you don't have a diploid pollinator, even in commercial production, they put twenty-five percent pollinator in the fields, transplant them, you know, in in commercial production, so they have enough pollen availability. Otherwise, if you just plant a one triploid, you're going to have nothing but vines and flowers. It'll never set. Yeah, You'll that's jungle basically. Exactly. That's why I wanted to ask because Patty, I remember when you had that AS winner. And so we, we had to make sure that everybody knew that they're, they needed to have one pollinator type. And so Dick, I have a question for you. Um, is that pollen, the pollinator seed, is it marked in the packets? Because in, in my yard, I would never know which seed is the pollinator and I don't have room for 11 plants in my yard. Um, we're assuming that they put four or five seeds in a hill. And so um, there's, you know, we usually overfill our seed packets. So if we say there's 10, if there's 10 seeds, we probably have 12, seed, 12 seedless ones and then maybe one or two of the seeded varieties. And so um, I guess we're depending on the law of averages that the, that uh, particular seeded variety will uh, make it into the into the soil um yeah we're taking yeah. a chance i guess we, you'd say. so we, we we do a similar thing for most of our customers we pre-blend the pollinator into the triploid for them but i choose a diploid pollinator that the seed size is drastically different so the average triploid seed count is about seven to eight thousand per per pound so it's a fairly large you know medium large seed size. And I typically will either put in an even, lar uh, even larger, depending on what my customer is requ re requesting, um, to, you know, the pollinator for me to put in there. And so, or I choose a very, very small one. 
you know, for example, a lot of people like to use sugar baby or crimson sweet for a pollinator. Sugar baby tends to flower earlier than most triploids, so that makes it a great pollinator. Crimson sweet does, you know, does the same thing. But those have a around 12,000 to 12,500 seed count. So it's very, very easy to tell the diploid. Does that make sense? sense also oh that that makes I, I, total sense yeah pretty sure that's what we do too i mean um yeah crimson sweet has, has been all around for a long long time it's a really great melon so um yeah and it's got oh go ahead patty and and then so my test a lot of them will say you know look for the you know look for the smaller seed to be the diploid the larger seed to be the triploid and be sure to plant you know, one hill of the diploid and one hill of the triploid or, you know, and keep them, you know, and, the, you know, you, the relatively space that you have to do, you can't go more than, you know, five feet away or, you know, five feet, you know, five feet or less, you know, six at the minimum, you know, but no more than 10 feet in, in the, you know, the same vicinity. Otherwise they won't pollinate either. Exactly. Yeah. Great answer. So Nancy, hopefully that answered your question. So you can, you know, somewhat take your chances or you can plant one of your um, seeded watermelons that you know you have and definitely keep it close enough so that they get pollinated. Um, there was another question here that I forgot to ask. Um, what about breeding on, oh, no, are the smaller varieties suitable for indoor growing under lights? Oh, you know, that's a, that's yeah. a, that's ahead, a great question. Ahead. I'll let, yeah. Um, certain varieties of watermelon, just like tomatoes and peppers, perform way better indoor under light and others don't. So if, if, if there isn't any published information about what varieties work best or recommended by the seed company, what work best in, in a greenhouse setting or an indoor setting with light, um, I, it, it, then you're going to be you're basically going to be doing a trial because definitely high light conditions are much better for and warmer conditions for watermelon. So I would really depend on your seed, you know, your seed company that, you know, your seed vendor of what they recommend for that type of um, growing environment. Yeah. I, I would say that unless you've got a, a mansion growing watermelons indoors is probably not a great thing to do because they take so much space. If you've got a greenhouse or, or you've got a sunroom or something like that that you want to fill with vines, um, go at it, I guess. Um, but um, I think most people would um, grow watermelons outside. The other problem I think is uh, the, the pollination is done by bees. You'd almost have to- um, Hand pollinate. You'd, yeah, you'd have to hand pollinate if you wanted to uh, the fruit to set indoors. Here's another good question. And I think a lot of people struggle with this. Um, I have a watermelon plant in a container outside in Maryland. We have no idea what the variety is. So we're struggling with when to harvest it. The largest one so far now is approximately six inches in diameter. Any thoughts on to how, I, how I'll know when it's ready to harvest? <laughs> yeah, go around pump it. No, uh, um... One of the one of the things that I tell people to do is to watch the tendril on the other side of the um, where the where the uh, melon is attached, and when the tendril starts to dry up, it means that the water that the melon is probably mature. Um, I don't know of any other thing that I mean the thumping uh, you, when it sounds hollow. I guess that's another another way to tell, but really the only way to tell is to cut it open, and if it's uh, sweet, you hit it right, and if not. Um, you haven't. I don't know, Patty. Do you have any other uh, ways? <laughs> that <laughs> I I cut a lot of watermelons and I do a lot of watermelon trials, being a watermelon breeder. And um, <laughs> four, four ways: relatively, you know, the days to maturity, because most watermelons, you know, indicated indicated on a um, seed packet will tell you how many days from seeding or from maturity. The tendril definitely, and that's the way I look when most of the tendrils are all starting to dry. There's also a little auxiliary kind of leaf, leaflet that's near that tendril. They call it the pig's ear. When that starts to dry up or is dry, that's another indicator. And then of course the, you know, the tone of when you thump on it, it, it it's, it's much more hollower or lower sounding. So 
the but color sometimes. truthfully, yeah, and the color, yeah. Some people say they get a yellow spot on the bottom. Um, they, <laughs> you're going to think this is weird, but this is how I tell in seed production. They, they, they tend to get this instead of being very, very shiny when they're small. They kind of, kind of get this gray tint to them. You know, kind of like a, kind of like a waxy gray protective layer that's on them. Hmm. And that, you know, that's that's an indicator of maturity too. Kind of like my hair. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing about myself, though. It's like, okay, as we get older, our hair gets gray. So uh, our watermelons also have a little yeah, gray sheen to them. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, what about? Okay, this is kind of a two two part question. Um, watermelons and other melons are very high percentage of water. So does that mean they need more water than your average garden plant or do they need less? And can you do anything with your water or fertilization that would make a watermelon sweeter or it's going to be as sweet as it's going to be because of its breeding? You want to handle it, Patty? So, start. <laughs> so, so actually over watering a watermelon is going to reduce your sweetness level. So watermelons and cantaloupes, as I mentioned earlier in the call, are basic, you know, pretty much desert plants and they don't like to be overwatered. So, and actually overwatering is one of the biggest problems when it comes to growing watermelons is you tend to overwater them instead of underwatering them. Yeah. So if, if you overwater, you'll actually reduce your sugar level. A lot of sweetness has to do with breeding. Yes, there's a certain amount of it because certain watermelons have much higher sugar level. Like, you know, the old OP variety Congo has a higher sugar level than, you know, most other, you know, crim you know, even crimson sweet and, um, you know, Charleston gray, some of those, they're all sweet to me, but you know, if you want to get out a refractometer and you want to go taste the sugar level, but truly cutting the water off probably at least three weeks before maturity is, is going to be able, is, is the easiest, best way to, um, to increase your sugar level of your finished fruit. Okay. And the other problem with overwatering is that the melons are very soft and especially with water, uh, watermelons, they get the phytophthora uh, rot and it'll take uh, a whole crop out. So I tend to tell people not to uh, water your vine crops unless you're in an extremely hot, dry uh, situation. And then when you do water them, water them heavy so that the soil is saturated and then let them dry out. In fact, one of the products that we sell in our catalog is a is called a melon cradle. It's a kind of a wire um, um, device that you can actually put the watermelon or the musk melon on that keeps it off the ground so that the part of the melon isn't on the ground because if it's too wet, that bottom of the melon tends to rot pretty easily. And so, um, like Patty said, I think uh, unless you've got really hot, dry conditions and you haven't had any rain, um, let your melons do what they want to do and they'll be sweeter and, and better for that. So what yeah, if I the notice- rhymes, the rhymes get harder. Okay. That's, that's yeah, good to know. And what about the, the vines? If you see them drooping, is that, um, is that a sign that they do need some water? That's, that's a sign of either they need water or it's over irrigation. <laughs> Believe or, it or not. The other thing is they could have vine bore too. Yep, yeah. Disease or an insect. So yeah, I talked a little bit about that earlier where you put a shovel full of soil over the vine about three feet away from the root system and it forms another root system. So that kind of is one of the ways. And, and it seems like vine bore is a, is a environmental thing, I guess. Some summers they're really, really aggressive and other summers you never see them. So, and it doesn't seem to have any rhyme or reason whether it's a wet or a dry summer. It just seems like once in a while you get a season where you get a lot of vine bores and other times you don't get any, so. Um, here's, here's a good question. Um, if you have a watermelon in a container, um, do you let them, the vines hang outside the container and trail on the patio and um, mature on the patio? Or should you put them inside the container to protect them from 
all the little critters that like to eat the little watermelons. I'd say that's personal preference there. I mean, yeah, that's exactly. If, if you have a big enough, if you have a big enough patio, and you, you know, I, I've seen people that grow them on the on a patio like that, and then they'll set their fruit up on a box to protect them from the heat of the cement, or you know, so you know, you, you, you know, it can be a little cardboard box, a little wooden, box, a little something, but something to protect the fruit, and then they just let the vines trail all over the patio. If you're in a smaller patio area, you might want to trellis them up, or you know, support them on some kind of staking or an aperture or something. Yeah, that's what I was going to say too. A trellis, if they want to tie them up, a trellis, and then tie the fruit up so that the so that the fruit doesn't destroy the vine. But uh, you can do either. I guess it's personal. Okay. Have you ever seen or um, experimented with growing melons hydroponically? I have not. No, I have not either. But I've done some vegetables hydroponically and. Uh, you get accelerated growth under a hydroponic situation because they, the vines, uh, when you bathe them with water and then the water drains away, it seems like they grow like crazy. I've mm -hmm. done some of the root crops and uh, done some radishes and uh, uh, yeah, the, it's, it's a uh, very accelerated way of growing vegetables, but it's also expensive because of all the equipment and things you have to have to do yeah. it um so yeah, here's and i don't know how much oh. research it if, if you're interested if, if there's any published research you know it may be research from you know the uc extension or you know master gardeners or something like that that may have you know some kind of other information i i have never done it myself so yeah. Okay. Um, so this question, um, I think is appropriate coming toward this time of year. Um, there's some proponents of clipping the vines so that all the energy goes into the melons that are already on the vines. Um, do you recommend pruning or clipping the growing vines? I wouldn't clip the vine, um, I but I'd remove some of the flowers. You know, if you, for, not with melons, but with pumpkins. If you want to grow a giant pumpkin, if you, um, I think you choose the, like the fourth or fifth flower and you let that one set and then you take all the rest of them off so that, and then you fertilize the vine so that you get a huge vine and it throws everything into that one fruit. But with, um, I don't think pruning the vines would, um, would make the melons bigger. I think it'd probably make them smaller because you've got less photosynthetic area working on making that fruit grow. I don't know. What do you think, Patty? I don't trim any of my vines, so um, that I you know I don't even do it in seed production, really. You know, so I I just tell people you know it's difficult to you know if you prune the wrong one or this or that. I just tend not to not to clip them back after the fruit are set or. Um, I, I always feel that vine crops, you know, it's, it, they're they're so full of water and they have such a high level of water that when you come and clip, I mean, if it's a broken branch, I don't, you know, I, I you know, I, I'll clip it off if it's broken in the wind or something, but I don't typically, you know, prune it down to one or two. Part, part of the reason that you have such a large canopy is to protect the fruit from sunburn and to protect the fruit from insects, you know, like aphids and things like that. You know, they're going to get all over the plant. They're going to get on the plant before they're going to get on the fruit. So I, I tend not to recommend to anybody, you know, any trimming or pruning or anything like that on their vine seed crops. Good information. We just busted a garden myth, I think. So it's always good to have our experts here. Um, so in all this that we're talking about, we're, we're kind of focusing on watermelons, but I'm assuming it's pretty much the same for all the melons, cantaloupe, honeydew, et cetera. Are there any things, um, any tips on growing any of the other types of melons that would be different from the ones we just talked about for watermelons? Not for me. I think most vine crops are pretty similar in the way they grow and the way they set fruit and the diseases and insects that bother them. So, um, yeah, I, I think what we've been talking about is is apropos for, for almost all of the vine crops. Yeah, whether it be watermelon, squash, pumpkin, cucumbers, uh, you know, winter squash, 
the, the the only difference is you know with your you know it, it is the restricted bind ones you know if you truly are you know want to be you know you have a small space area then i would tend to go to you know restricted bind pumpkins which they do have or squash or some most summer squash are already bushed cantaloupes watermelons cucumbers you 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 can almost buy a restricted vine you know crop in all the different cucurbit species excellent and um i don't think we talked much about uh fertiliz fertilization um so as far as you know from the time you first plant them through harvest um should you fertilize if so what do you use for fertilization, uh, what I tell people to do is to fertilize them when they first plant them because you want to get them off to a good start. And unless the leaves are light green or you see a situation where you want to encourage the vines, you, uh, uh, you won't fertilize them. And if you do fertilize them, you want to use a, a fertilizer where the first number isn't too large compared to the others. Because if you use too much nitrogen on vines, they tend to grow a lot of vines, but it tends to inhibit the flowering. So I don't know if you have anything, so, Patty. Yeah, I, I, you nailed it. Um, first of all, vine crops, um, minus pumpkins tend to be a little bit heavier feeder, but um, I, I typically never in a field situation put over 90 to 100 units of nitrogen per, per acre. And people always say, well, how do I translate that to a garden setting? So what I do is I recommend a triple 15 fertilizer. So that's 15% nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And in the size of a quarter, you, you broadcast it before you seed your, you know, your vine seeds. Because typically you're going to put them in, you know, a large area or the same area because they take the same fertilizer requirements. And, and I say you need to have like 9 to 12 little pellets of you know, fertilizer, triple 15 fertilizer in a quarter size. And you're going to then get, you know, somewhere between that 90 to 110, but you, you, you'll hit that sweet spot for vine seeds. Of course, tomatoes and peppers take much more nitrogen. Okay, good, good. That's, that's always seems to be a common question is for anything with gardening. When do I fertilize mm -hmm. and how much? I guess one of the things that I that I always tell gardeners in general is that if you uh, if you do composting and put your fertilizer into the compost bin and and get it into a uh, uh, an organic and keep your soil uh, you know do that year after year and the color of your plants is nice and green you really don't have to do much fertilization except on things like onions and tomatoes and even with tomatoes you really don't have to do a lot but as long as your garden is in a reasonable uh, uh, fertility level, you really don't have to add a lot of extra uh, fertilizer on any, most of any of the crops. So it's true. It's, happy, happy soil. And if you're, you know, adding, adding the appropriate amount of compost and, you know, or, you know, even, even if you're just doing it in, you know, organic teas or something, you're going to know if everything else is performing, just don't put extra on. I mean, I always tell them don't put extra on your vine seeds because then you're going to grow vines and not fruit. Excellent. Okay. Um, it looks like we've got about 10 minutes left. So if anybody has any other questions, they can put them in chat. Otherwise, I was going to let both Dick and Patty kind of um, summarize uh, with any additional advice or clever tips or, you know, maybe some varieties that uh, you guys really like or that you would challenge people to try in their own garden. I'll just give you guys both a chance to to summarize. And then if there's any other questions, I'll make sure I ask those at the end. Sure. sure. You want to go first, Patty? Um, Sure, that sounds great. Um, so I would, I would encourage people. A lot of people are intimidated by growing large, you know, like like a large garden with vine seeds and you know melons and watermelons and cucumbers. I I tell them as soon as you have grown them, and you taste the difference being, between what you can typically get at the grocery store, it's a huge difference. So I mean, and I'm not saying you're not going to get good quality. It's just different. I mean, you're growing it in your own garden, and it and it tastes you know, fresh and different. You just, I mean, it's just vine ripe picked. 
And so I say, don't be, don't be frightened to do it. It's the same thing with triploid watermelon. And, and if you don't succeed the first time that you do it for the first year, don't be frightened to not do it the next year because, you know, this isn't, the, you know, you're not growing lettuce. You're growing something to absolutely full maturity and, you know, seed maturity at the same time. Yeah. Some, a slightly over mature cantaloupe is exactly what I'm harvesting in a seed production field. So, you know, people tell, oh, no, I don't want to grow a melon. I don't want to grow a cucumber. I don't want to grow, you know, a large scale pumpkin. I don't want to grow a watermelon because it's just going to be too difficult or take up too much space. I always tell them, give it a whirl. I mean, what's, what's wrong with having a beautiful vine growing all over your patio? So I, 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 I use both hybrid and OP varieties and I grow and sell both organic seed and conventional seed. And it's absolutely personal preference of what you want to grow. My favorite eating cantaloupe is not a hybrid. It's an OP. It's um, Imperial PMR 45 and bred right here in California um, in conjunction with UC Davis. And it has the best flavor and easy to grow and powdery mildew resistant, you know, so that's my favorite cantaloupe. My, my favorite, I'm not a fan of seedless watermelon. I don't like the texture of the flesh, but I always say all my watermelons are seedless because I, I'm not, I, I just cut them open and eat, and eat the heart out and don't worry about the seeds. So those are just some fun colloquialisms of you know mine. And I do tend to go to, even in my garden, grow the more restricted vine types. So, but like I said, I think it's absolutely personal preference. Yeah. And Patty, I've seen your watermelon fields. I won't say patches. I'll say fields, acres and acres. So when you grow that many watermelons, yeah, you can just eat the heart out. You can ignore the rest. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I, I go out in the morning and I have breakfast because I'm always out early in the morning because it's hot here in Northern California. And, um, I, I don't even take them home and put them in the refrigerator. So <laughs> that's, that's the way that but they I, taste the best, I think. <laughs> Okay. Um, we do Dick, before we get into your summary, um, there is another question because it has to do with, um, you know, post harvesting and at the end. So what's the best way to store the melons after you harvest? And if they're different for the different types, um, how long might one last? And again, that's probably different for the different types of melons, but if one of you can comment on that and then we'll switch it back to Dick for his summary. I think people would be surprised to know how long that a commercial, uh, seeded and and seedless watermelon are stored before they get to the grocery store and, and how far they're shipped. So watermelon storage ability I'm, it is, is probably much longer than the average person thinks. Um, refrigerated, I bet you, you can keep it two to three weeks to a month. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say, watermelon a month. Cantaloupe's not quite that, but uh, um, it depends on how ripe they are when you harvest them and, uh, and you know, how, how cold you store them, so. Yeah, I would say a month on watermelon if they're if, if they're a watermelon that's reaching maturity but not over mature because once they go over the over the hill so to speak uh, and the seeds are um, are set and uh, viable then the melons tend to break down a little bit faster so uh, when that tendril starts to um, dry up that's a good sign that you want to cut that watermelon off if you want to store it for a while. Great. Yeah. Okay. And the, the, the average gardener to notice the difference. So as they tell, and you know, you're going to be, everybody will become a watermelon expert on harvesting a watermelon after you've known you've cut it too early or cut it too late. The, even, even in the triploids, there's undeveloped ovules, the, the industry calls them pips. If that area of the flesh around the seeds or those in you know, immature blank seeds and triploids, if that, starts to break down, it's slightly over mature. And I'm sure you've seen that when you cut open a watermelon and you look around, e even watermelons at the grocery store, if you see that area that there's a little bit of a blank area or a little bit of a, you know, open area around the seed, that, that watermelon is just, just slightly over mature. Yes. Okay, Dick, do you want to do your summary now? Some final thoughts on growing melons. Okay. Well, my first, uh, my first real uh, um, experience with the melons was when my grandfather, Grandpa John, 
took me out to Rocky Ford, Colorado. He usually made an annual trip because he loved to go to the mountains and it was a good excuse to go. And Crimson Sweet was a brand new variety. And I, and uh, the, that particular variety has been with us forever. And it just is the sweetest um, tasting watermelon you'll ever see. So um, that was my first uh, real experience with uh, seeing um, watermelons grown out in a, in a seed field and they were really good. But yeah, uh, like Patty said, uh, if you've never done it, uh, if you've got the room for it, uh, they're not that hard to do. Um, and I always tell people, even generally with a garden, to keep a notebook on what varieties you use, the soil texture that you have, because uh, the varieties that um, do the best uh, for you might not be the best for somebody else. Because if you've got a nice deep black soil like we have here in Randolph, if you've got a clay soil or a sandy soil, the varieties that you use may differ a little bit. And that's why we don't have just one watermelon or one carrot or one radish or one bean because they all tend to uh, do better in different circumstances. So by keeping a notebook, you'll know exactly what varieties to use and when you plant them and when you harvest them, whether it was just right or whether you want to plant them a little earlier or a little later. So, you know, uh, gardening is a fun recreation. I just, I, even though it's my business, um, I love to have my own garden and, uh, Although I didn't have one this year because I built a new house, uh, I've I've have got, I've had gardens since I was a small child, and my dad was teaching me how to grow things. And I think for anybody that wants to get their kids involved with uh, with something that you do as a family, gardening is the best thing that you can do because you have to weed the garden to get the crops, but then you have that 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 satisfaction of going out to the garden and pulling off an ear of corn or pulling some radishes or now getting some carrots and taking them in the house and not taking them out of a plastic bag but taking them out of your garden they, they may or may not be sweeter than what you get in the grocery store but they sure taste that way yeah great tips um just garden. yeah yeah just try it um not to use um that one athletic company's logo, but just, just try it. Just, just go, uh, just go out and garden. I think keeping track, keeping a journal. I, yeah, great advice. I don't always follow it, but it is great advice. And then the next year, I'm always sorry that I didn't write some of those things down, but yeah, well, um, our hour is coming to an end and it was, it was a wonderful conversation with both of you. Um, Patty, I'm glad you were able to make it on. Sorry, we can't see you. And Dick, thank you very, very much. Um, you, you both had wonderful time. tips. Yep. We, I enjoyed it. Um, great opportunity to get, uh, get some, uh, gardening knowledge out to, to people. Absolutely. And speaking of getting that gardening knowledge out, um, we had quite a few people register for this. So um, we will send out a follow-up email with a recording, with a video recording of it. So we'll get that um, email out either yet this afternoon or on Monday, not only to the people that were on the call, but also everybody else who registered. Um, we'll send this out so that they can watch it at a later date. So with that, thank you very much to everybody and have a wonderful weekend and go out and garden. Just do it. Happy gardening. Thank you.